to hear from John's Gospel. Um, again, if you don't know, I'm Brad Binow, uh, recently of Trinity Goodson Seminary. Um, my sister Carol is here today. Uh, she, has, she has said to others that she's my older sister, so I didn't want to dwell on that, but it is, it is true. Not that much. Uh, so nice to have her in town. Um, and John Disbro pointed out to me, I did not know this, today is the 214th anniversary of the birth of Charles Darwin. So I did not plan to be talking about Charles Darwin. It just so happens that way. So this is Darwin Day or whatever the case might be. Uh, well, at 214 years, it might have been a little frayed around the edges. I don't like and who in the world would have enough candles to do uh, Anyway, so uh, the focus today is on I'm just calling God after Darwin uh, to look at Darwin's, what some call his dangerous idea, others would refer to as his generous gift, and we'll try to sort that out. But to set that up uh, from John's Gospel, go for it. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. Thank you. Amen. So um, you probably know that in the beginning of the book of Genesis, there are two accounts of creation but actually in the whole bible there are three accounts because that's one of them uh and we tend to think you know just the genesis uh one and two and three is the kind of beginning story but how does that begin it begins in the beginning mm -hmm. so there we are um is there anybody here who was not here last week oh, okay <laughs> well, <laughs> Oh well, for, well, for, for the yeah, okay. Well, for the benefit of all of us, I, I just do a real quick uh, back up to where we were. It's kind of like you know, once the broom sweeps the floor, you always got to go back and get a few more crumbs and kind of move everything into the same pile. So that's what I want to do. Um, the reason these books are here, and don't look too carefully because I didn't put them in order one through thirty, but mm -hmm. whatever. Um, this was a reminder from last week that if if you take what we now take to be the age of the cosmos at 13.8, I have it up here, 13.8 billion years on our timeline, is something we're able to deduce now with the help of Luke's web telescope and other things, that if you took 30 volumes and each volume had 450 pages in it, which these don't, but it's close enough, uh, and you allocated a million years to each page, so 450 million years per volume, you'd have about 13.8 billion years and then we look to see that if if you open the first volume to page one you would have what is considered scientifically now to be year zero the big bang the as far back as we can trace by looking at at galaxies in the universe and the light they emit when you look at that on a spectrum of blue light to red light uh things that are moving faster and are farther away create what's called a red shift and so almost everything in the galaxy, galaxies that you look at is moving away. There are some blue shifting things that are actually, because it's a big place, some things move, look like they're moving toward us. But at any rate, through all that, you, you can do the math, not on the back of an envelope. But it's very sophisticated math will tell you 13.8 billion years. If you go along, it's you get up to volume 20, then two thirds of the way through before you have the formation of what we know as our solar system. And then things uh, move along. Volume 21, you get the very first evidence of life on Earth. That's about 9.4 billion years along. And it takes another eight, seven, eight volumes till you get to multicellular organisms. I mean, something beyond just the most basic one cell thing. Uh, at volume 28, they've only got two more volumes to go at that point. Complex life forms come in volume 29. And then a bunch of stuff that is around us now all sort of falls together right at the very end. We get upright human-looking ancestors. Um, 
at the 444th page of volume 30, right? Mm -hmm. So it's only 450 pages. Uh, dinosaurs appear and go extinct in the last uh, few pages. And when you get to the last paragraph of the last volume near the end, well, whatever, you know, you get what we look like now. Um, so this is, I, and I think, is a helpful tool, but also an impossible one. Who can find, if this is a, you can't conceptualize 13.8 billion years. So this is both true and phony, kind of all at the same time. But if it, you know, if it's helpful, uh, there you have it. So from time zero to 2023, that's the journey. And what I proposed last week is that there is a, there's a story uh, that's somehow being revealed and that we are trying to read when we look at the 13.8 billion year history of the cosmos. Something we didn't touch on last week, but uh, just didn't get to it, I want to mention. The concept that the cosmos has both an, an outside story and an inside story. And what physicists uh, who want to think theologically or theologians who want to think scientifically mean is that the outside story of the cosmos is the province of science. It's the it's the factual stuff you can see and measure. How fast are those galaxies moving? Where does the light come on the spectrum? What does the fossil record tell us? What is quantum theory review? All that stuff. The, the physics of it are the outside observable story. But there is also an inside story because and when you move along the timeline, what's happening right here in modern humans and where the more highly developed life is, we have we have self-awareness and, and self-consciousness. So we are actually able to think about what we are observing. And so the development, <clears throat> the development of, of uh, consciousness is also a part of evolution. And so there was life before life was aware of itself. <laughs> but now we've come to the point where we are aware of it. Um, and so that's part of the inside story. So another way to think about that is that the scientific deal is, is the physics. The inside story is what we would call metaphysics. Um, the, the science of it helps us get at the question of how, how did this happen? We've got the chemistry and the astrophysics to help us out. The inside story is looking for answers to the question, why Why did this happen? What is this all about? Um, one theologian scientist I mentioned last week, John Polkinghorne, um, says, that, I'll make sure I get his image right here, that if you, it's something like if you have a, you've got a, pot, a boiling kettle of water on the stove, uh, and someone says, you know, what's this all about? Uh, you'd say, well, the, the burner is boiling the water. That, that's what's going on. That's the outside story. That's the physical story. Another way to look at it, what what's that doing? If, uh, I want a cup of tea. <laughs> that's the why. <laughs> why is that there? I mean, that, that, but you don't. So the, the physics, the outside story doesn't give you or even, even bother with looking for reasons. The inside story is probing what's this all about? Um, and what I want to talk about today is how those two stories maybe work or don't work with each other. But just to go back to one other thing that we talked about last week, three different ways of reading the story. <coughs> we talked about the archaeonomy, big word simply meaning the, the beginning of the story. That's a Greek thing. But it's this is the view of sort of scientific materialism that would say, we read the story only as an outside story because that's all you can ever, that's all that's really true or that you can know. You can only know what you can observe. Now, that's a whole other philosophy <laughs> lesson, but we won't get into all that. But I think you're kind of acquainted with how that works. Um, and this way of reading the story suggests that everything that is right up to you sitting there at this moment with your hand placed that way, if we could do all the math right, we would know from the first instant of the Big Bang how that happened. Everything was set in motion to, to carry forward to the place where we are. There's a, there's a distinct, I mean, science doesn't claim to be able to do the 
geometry and math to do that, only to assert that it is possible because everything was set in motion chemically and so forth uh, and to, to get us to exactly where we are. So this way of reading the story says um, it, there's no real uh, ongoing developing plot line to the story. What is, is. It just is. Uh, another way to read the story, and this is time-honored and been used by people of faith, especially Christians for centuries and centuries, is to read the story by way of analogy and to say, what, what you see here is not really the most real of the real in the universe. This is all a faint image of heavenly perfection that is beyond time, up there, out there, somewhere. Um, and uh, at some point will be will be transferred from or lifted out of this reality and find an eternal place in the other reality. Um, and one of the things I forgot to mention last week, one of the shortcomings of this is the, the analogical way of reading the cosmic story sets up some some unreal, unrealistic expectations about perfection and morality, as if there is something out there perfect that we're not good enough to get to, but someday we'll be fished out of this and transported to that. It, I don't want to make too much of that, but just might ponder that, that it, whether that leads to some difficulties. But where we're where I'm trying to go, where we're trying to go is yet another way to read the whole story which is an anticipatory way of reading it, which is to say that whatever is real is still out there in the future, and that the cosmos is, in fact, still evolving, still being created, still aiming towards something. And the whole process here is more being, being pulled forward out of the future than pushed forward out of the past. So the archaeonomic way of reading things is, is very stuck on the past. If you go back far enough, you'll you'll know how everything came to be how it is. But the, the image I think I used last week for that is if you, if you want to know what a river is all about, Mississippi, for instance, you don't go to the headwaters to that little lake up there in northern Minnesota. You go down to New Orleans and look at the delta because everything that's come through that you figure it out by what's all washed downstream to the end of things. That would be the argument for the anticipatory reading, which makes a lot of sense to me, rather than the archaeonomic way of doing that. I think I'm, I made the analogy that in my field of pastoral theology, a lot of psychotherapy depends on this view, actually, that you can figure <laughs> out how you got here by going back to your childhood and your toilet training and what happened on your birth moments and all that. And that's useful. But a very different way now of helping people therapeutically is to look at it anticipatorially. What is what is the future you're being drawn to? Can you begin to imagine that? And so a phrase that's sometimes used and it fits for cosmology or psychotherapy or whatever, can you remember the future? Mm -hmm. right? um, well, but think about how many times in the Old Testament, you know, people are being reminded of what God has promised and they are supposed to live into that was there in the first message today. Um, and so another, one of the authors I've been mentioning, John Hawk, talks about this way as the, the Abrahamic way of reading the story, because all three major religions uh, of Judaism, Islam, and Christianity rely on Abraham as a, and Sarah as the parental figures who embrace the promise, who, who can remember the future and live into it. They go where they're supposed to go, even though they don't fully know and understand um it's not that they're being pushed out of where they came from they're being pulled toward something with a promise so we'll talk more about promise in that yeah I, thank you go ahead <laughs> um archaeonomic rk is the greek word for beginning so. it's like sorry um it's a uh, it's like the timeline Right, it's very linear. Whereas, so like this invisible core meeting that we're proposing is non-linear. Um, not quite, but you have to come back next week for the Einstein discussion. <laughs> when we're going to try to get more deliberately into the time. Where are you? No, 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 you're reading over time. Uh, um, 
No, because the anticipatory reading is actually saying that time is real. Now, for most of us, that's not, a, I think we all sort of intuitively know that, but in the scientific field, and, and what Einstein thought was, time is not beginning anywhere and going to some future. Time is, a Einstein thought, part of the space-time continuum, right? right? Or, or the space and time are interwoven. Right. But what what Einstein eventually himself had to admit was, no, time is actually real. Things did, even his, his own math showed this, although he was reluctant to embrace what his own geometry revealed, that there was actually a factual, uh, there is a historical past, and by nature, there, things are actually going somewhere. Mm -hmm. The cosmos is not a steady state, just poop, plop down, everything is the way it is. Things, well, it's expanding and moving. So I don't know if that helps, but it, I, I get your point of clarity, which is a good one. We don't want to stay stuck in the linear. We want to look towards something because we don't know what the end game is. That, I mean, it, because the, the anticipatory way suggests that there is much, much, much more to come. I mean, let's add 13 billion volumes to this 30 or whatever. And you just don't know, but that it is going somewhere. And so we're not stuck with just what we have in the in the moment. Bob, you've got but the, Bill, sorry. The academy, too, says there is an end game somewhere. I'm trying to figure but, it out. Right. But this, it goes into the future as well. Yes. Um, and we'll get to some of that, I hope. Um, I don't pretend to have all the answers. I'm just, I'm just trying to give questions. <laughs> right. Uh, well, okay. Let's uh, um, let's move to some new stuff. Let's get into what we're getting into today. We'll see where this goes. So, Charles Darwin. Let's talk for a minute about who he was and what his significance. He was born in 1809. Okay, so that makes this the 200. 14th anniversary, died in uh, 1882. And he was a scientifically minded Englishman, a naturalist. Um, he spent 20 or 30 years doing very careful research uh, on plant and animal life. You probably know he took his famous voyage on the HMS Eagle. Uh, it sailed all over the world and spent significant time in the Galapagos Islands where he could study in an isolated environment where, you know, it, it, those islands are way out there and what happens there kind of stays there. Um, and out of all this and the journals he kept and whatnot, he came to his uh, concept of evolution, which he published in, uh, now this is not the original uh, 1859 version, but it's, it's 1911. I pulled it out of the seminary library. So it was 120 years old. On the origin of species, this is Darwin's research. Um, that led to his thoughts about evolution. Um, so you got to think about this for a minute. We talk about creation as if um, this is all creation. In fact, it's it's an honest question to ask: Is the cosmos a creation? You ever think about that? So. The archaeotomists, the scientific materialists, would say, no, the cosmos is. That's how Einstein looked at it. Uh, it is. It always has been. It's never going to end. It just is. There was no moment when things came into being by the word or whatever, Genesis or whatever, it, or a Big Bang. It just is. Well, the Big Bang, now that we've come to understand that, suggests that, well, there was some kind of a beginning, that still doesn't make any kind of ironclad case for what we see being a creation. Because creation implies a creator, and that's part of the inside story, not necessarily the outside story. Uh, although, well, we'll get into more of that later. Um, so many people then would claim that when Darwin published in the world, and he wasn't the first to come up with evolutionary ideas. He just, he did the hardest work and wrote it up the best, basically, and built on some other people. But many folks would claim that what, what Darwin was able to put forward by way of evolution destroys utterly concepts of God and theology. 
Uh, now, the odd thing is that there are two very opposing camps that actually agree on the same point. Uh, the scientific materialists, as well as the hardcore biblical fundamentalists, hold the exact same point of view. If evolution is true, then there is no God. Even though they you know, come from very different places, they're united in that assertion, right? Is that disturbing? <laughs> um, um, so... I mean, we're asking: Is that is that a is that an appropriate conclusion? Is it the only conclusion you can draw from Charles Darwin? Are there other ways to conceive this, and so forth? Um, yeah, yeah, John. Why do they come to that conclusion? Why is it that they close themselves off to the idea that God created, but He didn't create it statically, or that He didn't create it in an archaeonomic mm -hmm. way? That it it started here and naturally that and here. Why can't there be this variability and change within the system that God created? So you're talking about the religious end, not the scientific end. I mean, yeah, well, okay. I mean, the, the sci well, okay. Well, the, the, sci the, sci the, sci the scientist would say there is no empirical evidence of a creator or a god, and we, if we, what we can't measure, we don't trust to be true. Okay. It's like the Russian yeah, cosmonaut yeah. who said, I'm up here in heaven, I don't see any god. Okay, fine. But evolution itself, they don't necessarily have a problem. No, no, no. And, and, no. And so, but, but again, but the religious people that have a problem with evolution, yeah. because they think it in some way rejects god. Why, why do they come to that? I mean, you're you're now asking. Well, we talked about this a few weeks ago, and I talked to you out here in the lobby. Then we're asking a psychological question. So, again, there's cosmology, there's theology, but we don't want to forget the psychology that comes under this, which is why do I need to believe what I need to believe? And you can ask that of either camp. Why do the scientifically inclined folks need? Let's see. The, the scientific way that dismisses an inside story doesn't take into account that their own consciousness that's developed as part of evolution <laughs> is asserting a, a truth that they believe in without necessarily having evidence, but but it's legitimate for them. Okay. But to your point, I, I think it's this fear of the loss of an assumptive world that if if there's that much, well, we have to get into Darwin's theory here, but if there's the kind of randomness that evolution suggests, that stuff happens and it doesn't happen, and then certain things happen, but they peter out and that lifeline doesn't go anywhere and something else, it's too damn random. I want a God who's in charge of things. I want to make sure that things stay stable. I can't deal with the unpredictability. It's the same reason I would say why people gravitate toward conspiracy theories. You mean that randomness, though, sounds to me kind of, I'll just say, silly, because evolution occurs over a super expansive period of time that nobody can really observe now. So when I think of randomness, I think of it more uh, immediate, you know. You. Uh, and it just seems strange to me to think that over thousands and thousands or maybe millions of years that nothing changes. That seems crazy. Uh, what's the hymn about uh, uh, not changeth the or uh, not, what? I, not the changeth the I can't remember. Yeah, more that may be. Well, yeah. More of this, well, God only wise. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. A lot of a lot of inadequate theology is laced into our hymnody, and I would contend we get more of our theology from what we sing than, frankly, from what we hear. Sorry to say, but are you agreeing or disagreeing? You agree? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if I mean, but well, okay, I don't want to get too far down that path, but I think this is. Um, the conspiracy theorist will look at something, I mean, I take the Kennedy assassination as an example, refuses to believe that one person acting on impulse in a short amount of time could have changed the face of history. There's got to be more to it than that. I got to read back into the story and figure out how it, sometimes stuff just happens, you know, but yeah. Mm -hmm.
John, I have the answer to your question. In seventh grade confirmation class, oh, yeah. I, I put my hand up and I asked the pastor, fundamentalist pastor, why can't, couldn't God have created a world that keeps changing? Why do we have to believe this? And his answer is exactly what you're looking for. Quote, because we do, unquote. <laughs> there you go. And then he changed the subject. Well, <laughs> Let me let me say let me just highlight two, the two key aspects of Darwin's thinking that uh, that proved to be so problematic for people. Um, because what he's saying is that life, as we know it, life forms evolved naturally by a process of what he called natural selection. Naturally, okay. Um, there and that therefore this eliminates the need for a creator or any kind of inside story. Now the the way that this happens actually is a is a very messy and violent process. And one of the one of the things that's often cited uh, it's in here, if you dig far enough, um, there is a species of wasp called the Neumann wasp. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. You may have heard this story. That wasp looks for caterpillars in which it can lay its eggs, so that when the eggs hatch, they can eat the caterpillar from the inside out. And that's how this species of wasp reproduces itself. Well, there are other evidences of things like this that are violent beginnings to life, one species preying on another and so forth. But that little example is often used by by scientists to say, look, it, it, no no benevolent loving God would run a creation that way. That's 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 violent. That's terrible. That, that's suffering. Well, what we're going to get to, that, that all depends on how you want to understand God. Okay, But bracket that off for a minute. So natural selection is a, is a barrier for many people. Um, it, 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 it calls into question the, the notion that the idea of what's called common descent, that from some amoeba that crawled out of the slime or whatever, we have come to be who we are. And and that the process of getting us here was a messy, violent process is pretty off-putting. The the second idea of of natural selection then that as the you know the survival of the fittest basically uh, again what kind of god would run the universe that way right that that the the strands of life that we now may see in the fossil record that never made it didn't survive because they, they couldn't adapt, wouldn't adapt, were somehow biologically inferior to the stronger forms, the strong survive, the weak get washed away. Um, and that, so that's what scares people, I think, John, to say that, no, that can't be the way God operates. I know how God operates. And God is more powerful than that. God is uh, omniscient, what, what's the hymn? Um, Immortal. God is immortal, invisible, only wise, omniscient, omnipotent, and all those things. And then we want to say, I want to say, really? <laughs> How'd you figure that out? You know, well, what, what, how did you come to that conclusion? Because because I'm, I'm desperately uncomfortable to think of God in any other way, yeah. if you're honest about it. Uh, now, and I mean, we all will want to sit here and say, well, yeah, but I'm comfortable with it. Down below, I think it scares all of us that maybe the God that we thought we believed in doesn't operate in the way we thought, but we'll get to that. Okay, so this is what some people call Darwin, Daniel Dennett, who's a famous uh, archaeonomist, I guess you call him, calls this Darwin's dangerous idea. He dumped this into the world in 1859. It took some decades for people to digest, but it's blown apart any idea of God, of a created cosmos, and so forth. However, we can turn this over and suggest that I think Darwin's work is actually uh, not a dangerous idea, but a wonderful gift. And, and I'm not trying to just play fast and loose here and say, just forget about that. Let's look at this. Uh, just think this through for a minute. It, if it is a, if this is actually a dangerous idea, then what's theologically dangerous about it, I think, is that it now must fall into question all of our inadequate and shallow ideas about who God is and really make us do some rethinking. 
And it's dangerous when you start allowing the rug to be pulled out from under you, all the things that you thought were solid ground um, and aren't so solid, um, right? Um, so when you want to sing the hymn, you know, when, when all around my soul gives way, <laughs> who is then my hope and stay? It ain't the God that you learned about in Sunday school. I'm here to tell you. Um, it doesn't mean there's nothing, there is no solid ground, but it's it's not probably what we grew up with, which is not to dismiss any of our beloved Sunday school teachers, because we had to learn in age-appropriate ways with images that made sense to us. But if you if you can't move, evolve, right? <laughs> Beyond that, I'm not I, I mean, I just think you have an impoverished mm -hmm. spiritual life. That's I'm not, I'm not. Nobody's going to hell because of that or whatever, but it, it there's more, I think, that we can get to. So how is Darwin a gift? Well, um, Darwin, I think, pretty much helps us see that the, the theological approaches that want to frame who God is in terms of power and coercion just don't hold up. Because if God were that powerful, God would not have put in motion a messy universe where wasp eggs hatch and eat caterpillars from the inside as i got a stephen king right <laughs> but um uh and darwin's gift is now to open us again to read the entirety of the tradition about power being made perfect in weakness paul's insight about the cross so nobody's saying God's not powerful here. It's just, what do you think power means? You know, and is it, well, we'll get to that in a minute with intelligent design. Um, here's a definition, though, for power that I like. If power is the ability to bring about significant consequences. Think about that. Power is the capacity, the ability to bring about significant consequences. So that I have some power as a parent to raise and rear children and for good or ill there will be significant consequences right that just depends um a president who has power can bring about significant consequences partly because they have a finger on the nuclear button that's a pretty significant consequence but if you can if you can cajole and persuade other people to move in a certain direction and vote in a certain way and be taxed for certain reasons that's that's the ability to create a significant consequence. So if we apply that way of looking at power to God, then we ask, well, in what ways is the significant consequence of a creation starting or going anywhere? And I think that Darwin then gives us the chance to rethink uh, what God is about. It, 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 to some measure, because, well, this isn't totally dark. I mean, Darwin didn't think in terms of 13 to 28 billion years. He was only able to think thousands, but still it was bigger than what, what he knew, probably millions, bigger than the 4,004 years that some people were basing the cosmos on back in the mid 1800s. Um, there was, Darwin said, there's plenty of time and lots of space and lots of new stuff popping up here and there to, to, bring everything to set everything in motion to get us to where we are and probably beyond okay so i'm um, i'm at the uh, like the second or third bullet here so theological ways that people have responded to evolution um there's first of all the the mode of opposition uh, i'm against this so and, and now i'm leaving the science behind there's how theological people have responded uh, creationism is one way. That's the real hardcore fundamentalistic way of saying Genesis is a science document and tells us exactly day by day, maybe 4,004 years ago. I don't know how many people hold to that, but that um, that actually is based on the same the same conclusion of the scientific materials that if Darwin is right, then there is no God. I must now defend God's existence by asserting that the all-powerful God created everything just as it is. And, and so, like, you know, then you want to ask, well, who, who appointed you to be God's defense attorney here? But 
that's really the role that's taken up. I have to defend God against any accusations that God is not powerful enough to do this. So creationists, um, well, it, it, the unfortunate part is that this whole argument has now also become part of the culture wars. Because the creationists would say, you let evolution get into the minds of school children or whatever, you know, they're going to have, it takes away all the reasons for any kind of moral principles, any kind of values, any kind of stability in the culture, because you don't believe that you're, that you are answerable to a higher authority. Okay, well, um, so what, what ends up here is that that line of thinking has to assert that the biblical accounts in Genesis are, in fact, science, placed, placed right in there with Darwin. Um, but these are the same people who would say, <laughs> science doesn't know everything. There's more to it. And yet, ironically, they're saying, we've got a scientific alternative. Oh, but then your scientific alternative wouldn't know everything either. Oh, okay, then you got a problem. But if if you're so threatened by what all this means, you're not going to sit still for that kind of a discussion. Already. So all I can say is if you're going to enter into that kind of discussion with people, you have to be very patient and try to be understanding and so forth. Okay, so there's creationism. That's the far end of one spectrum. Much more interesting is the approach of what is called natural theology. So for many years, um, people would argue, and by the way, this is anchored in probably the 17th century, the, the Wilhelm Leibniz, German philosopher, you don't even know his name, but his idea was there is there's something he called the perennial philosophy, that if, if you just look at nature, you know that there was a hand here creating this. So you can read who God is by looking at nature. Now, that holds up in many ways until you get to that wasp example and you said, you know, you forgot about that. But, you know, the sun rises and sets, God sends rain on the just and the unjust, God, the, the stars stay where they're supposed to be, and the planets move, and it just suggests that there is an order and a design to things if you just look around yourself. Um, basically, Darwin made that notion utterly untenable that there's too much messiness and randomness and dead ends to the evolutionary process to suggest that there is a, a benevolent, I mean, if in however we want to understand benevolence, um, uh, orderly design to things. It's way more chaotic than the natural theologists or natural theologies would have suggested. Um, if If evolution suggests that this all is a long history of development and that it's still developing, um, it's hard to see in that way of thinking, well, where is the God who's supposed to care for the least of these, <laughs> right? I mean, the poor caterpillar really took it in a hard sort of way. Um, the, this caring me. Huh, well, that's it. So see see how yeah we bring we bring definitions to this that don't always account for the larger picture. So here's here's what some call a new natural theology that may have a, get a little more traction to it uh, and say no we're not going to just look at uh, look for evidence of God in what we see in the here and now. If you really want to do that, then you have to go all the way back to point zero and say somehow in that instantaneous moment of big big banginess um things were set in motion to get us to where we are and john kinghorn his book i didn't bring i mentioned he was the physicist at cambridge who became an anglican priest and then went back to physics he, he came up or suggests what he calls the anthropics the anthropic principle Uh, anthropos, human, whatever. And all that means is that the universe as it came into being was, and this is scientifically very well-grounded, very finely tuned. 
you had to have certain things happening in the first couple of seconds of the Big Bang to put the particles in motion to eventually give us what we know as the heavy elements necessary for carbon-based life. And I, just a little bit of milly squidge in here or there, you wouldn't get the same result. Um, it, it, there's a Now, even Falkenhorn would say, I, I am not making a knockdown, drag out argument that is proof for the existence of God. That's not it. All I'm saying is, I mean, I'm not saying, I'm just saying that <laughs> isn't this interesting? Um, that that it's not impossible to imagine a process that began in some slightly different way that wouldn't have led to anything. But what we got were these enormous heat factories that are the stars of the universe that, that are able to produce the, the elements that are needed eventually to become carbon-based life. Well, you need evolution to carry all of that forward. Now, there, uh, even that, I think, poses some theological problems, but again, I don't have absolute answers here, so bear with me. Um, but that that's a, that's a more refined way of thinking about natural theology that might be satisfactory to some. However, um, I think in some ways that's still a way of trying to read the cosmic story by going <laughs> back to the the headwaters of the river <laughs> rather than looking at whatever's downstream where the estuary is. It's it's a kind of I think refined archaeonomy, but but it's, it gets it's not terrible either. However, what we say in the Nicene Creed that we look for the life of the world to come. Right, that's a very, very careful, caring Christian thinkers, seventeen hundred years ago or whatever, came to that way of reading the story that we are looking for the life of the world to come, and so we we are anticipating the cosmos on the basis of what Jesus revealed about the coming kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God, reign of God. And that some image of that future, where it's all going, has already broken into the present. Not totally, but at least a glimpse. And well, we'll get to that by the end today. The, so another way to look at this is, I mean, one of the things natural theology implies then is that God is uh, is is a designer. Uh, did, I, did I even know that song, uh, Master Designer? was out there in in the 60s master designer whoever you are who put you there in the sky of deep blue whatever it's it's perfect natural theology it's trying to prove god because the clouds are where they're supposed to be and all that what what though if god is not an architect but rather a gardener all right so because even even with this idea we go all the way to the big bang and see everything set in motion it suggests that God has an absolutely fixed plan for how everything is going to come out, right? That, huh? Nah. Yeah, yes, which is a certain way of talking about power. And you have to have a kind of coercive power to make everything come out just the way it was destined to come out. However, if evolution is suggesting that, well, does it, you know, might be a little of this, a little, might be a little of that. It doesn't mean things won't come to a future that God embraces. It just means it could be coming out this way or that way. God can work with our stuff. So rather than say God is the architect of creation, we could say God is better understood as the giver of possibilities. You know? Um because if God is masterfully designing the whole creation with a pretty heavy hand to make everything go just the way God wants, then creation really isn't, well, cosmos, which we're going to say is a creation, um, is not really distinct from God. It, it's about the parenting analogy again. You know, do you live, do you try to live through your kids or for your kids? <laughs> and if you're trying to live through your kids, you're not letting them be distinct, differentiated people under themselves if you but what god i think is doing with creation is to say um I, i'm i'm with it all the way this is not the image of the watchmaker who winds it up and then walks away and leaves it alone that's not what we're talking about 
it's it's God saying, I want you to to live your own life and I'll be with you every step of the way, but I'm not going to force you to be this or that. Uh, you are not predestined to grow up and be a chemist or a lawyer or a school teacher or, you know, a carpenter. You, you, I don't, you know, I think God said, I don't know. I mean, you work it out. But whatever, wherever it goes, I'll be there with you and I can work something useful out of this. Okay. Now, um, now we get to the, the, the image of intelligent design. This is where it gets more complicated. So one of the ways people respond to this, and now this is being pressed on school boards and so forth, we should teach right alongside this, <laughs> because as they would say, this is only a theory. This is Darwin's theory of evolution. Well, Yes, but we operate our lives on a lot of theories that have proven to be demonstrably reliable. Um, yeah, gravity, for instance. Um, it's going to hit the floor every time. Um, so if that's only a theory, we have an alternative theory, which the theory of intelligent design. Now, again, it undermines its own argument by saying, well, this is an alternative theory. And if it's a theory, it's open to question and development, but whatever. Intelligent design, um, first of all, it's not science. So that's a bogus way to look at it from the get-go because it also does is not offering demonstrable outside story type facts, yeah. but be that as it may, it's not physics. Intelligent design is not physics, it's metaphysics, which is okay. But no, you gotta take it for what it is. Um, it, it, so this depicts God as the architect the designer, the planner, who needs a pretty heavy thumb on the scale to make everything go in the predestined way that God wants it all to somehow come out. Um, that everything that's happening is working along the lines of a predestined, predetermined plan. And that pretty much eliminates from the cosmic equation any sense of novelty, that anything truly new can happen. Uh, so this, this, I mean, so God becomes more like a, an architect working off of some giant blueprint that this has to happen now so that this can hold up that, you know, rather than a gardener who says, I'm going to put some seeds out there and uh, we're going to garden out of this one way or the other, but I, you know, the, the, the soil and the, everything, it's got the freedom to be itself, you know, which means that God is not God is not the equivalent of creation. God is the creator of creation. Yeah, go ahead. I mean, it's really beautiful. Yes, right. Yep. Yep. It's, uh, um, and you know, you can press this too far and say, yeah, except. The seeds have to do what they have to do because, you know, that's the way God created them and they don't have any. You can't grow a beanstalk out of a corn seed. Yeah, I know. We don't want to go there either. However, the, uh, <laughs> right. but evolution tells us that that certain life strands actually did adapt and change and become quite different things. Mm -hmm. And so if you allow that principle of newness and novelty to enter into the picture, it makes you psychologically nervous, at least for some people. So that's that's where and that answers John's question to some degree. I, I, all I want to say, we talked last week about the big picture as John Hott, whose book I've been following here, God After Darwin, let me just read. Um, he talks about what he calls the, um, rightness and, and not moral rightness, but that in, in the giant picture of where God is drawing us to out of the future things it's it's julian of norwich who said all will be well all will be very well in the midst of despair now what that gets us to is <clears throat> how it's going to be well i don't i don't know what that looks like but i know i trust this is the inside story that it will be that it will be well okay so god is the giver of of possibilities all right Two other things to get to here. There's also the possibility of reading the story by way of separation. And that is a way of saying, well, science and theology or religion are just completely different disciplines. We don't, we don't mess with this and they don't mess with this. 
And that actually makes them then compatible because they're not trying to do the same thing. So we can lay one right alongside of the other. Uh, there's no, they don't threaten each other. Um, and if, if science isn't interested in God, then science is not any threat to mm -hmm. theology. Um, and that means that whatever natural selection, random selection, chance, novelty is, is just God's way of, you know, doing things that we can't understand. Um, however, that leads you down a path that begins to say, well, the, the, whatever messiness there is in the creation, that's, that's just God's way of testing us. We don't understand why that is, but, but God will work it all out. And it, it always reminds me of that scene in, in Woody Allen's movie, um, Love and Death, where it's kind of based on war and peace, you may recall it. His character is looking out over this horrific battlefield that has been a massacre, you know, and his friend, I think Boris, says, God is testing us. And Woody Allen's character says, yeah, well, yeah couldn't he, like, give us multiple choice? <laughs> I mean, it, it it breaks down if if by trying to keep them separate, and then you have to hide behind the fact, well, we don't understand why it's so messy, but, but God is testing us. Okay. Um, I think if what we see is that even when science wants to draw a very clear, hard line between the inside and outside, the physics and the metaphysics, that doesn't even completely hold up because scientists themselves bring their own bias and convictions to things, just as people of religious faith do. And the inside story is always moving around in there somewhere. Um, okay, but let me get on to what I really want to end with here. That... The, the tragic nature of the universe, if we really take the evolutionary process seriously, that there's a lot of waste. I mean, all that stuff happening out there in the stars is burning up a lot of material and elements. And just to get to whatever it is we're getting to, it's an extravagant, profligate way of doing business. It, it all can lead us to a pretty despairing view of things, which in fact is actually what happened to Charles Darwin. He was a person of faith, Anglican, but as he worked it all out and thought about its implications, uh, he was not able to set aside certain conceptions that he grew up with about God and then decided that you know, there really isn't a God that's in charge of this as a creator. Um, so the question I want to ask is, you know, how willing are we to really to set aside or eliminate certain conceptions we have had about who God is so that we do not have to just say, I don't want to believe it. It's, no, eh, it's nice, but I'm, I'm over here in my own world and I don't have to deal with this. That's a very separatist sort of notion. Um, I don't think separation is, is the way it goes. Interesting insight from a Alfred North Whitehead, who is a process philosopher. Um, he, this is a good observation that when Christianity entered the Western world, the Roman Empire, after Constantine um, came out of the Middle East, but when it entered the Western world, the image for God became Caesar, mm -hmm. and, the, and the suffering Jesus of Nazareth got left behind. And I think that's true. Um, and in fact, the New Testament was written that is that for instance the angels are said to sing at the birth of Jesus Gloria in excelsis Deo right glory to God in the highest Gloria was an attribution only for Caesar and so that's a that's a profound political statement <laughs> that Luke wants us to pay attention to in the in the birth narrative of Jesus Gloria in excelsis, to God in the highest, not to Caesar. But we've kind of had trouble remembering that, and and the Caesar. So the images of God as powerful, omniscient, omnipotent, coercive, tend to keep bleeding into our understanding. So, um, I, I think if um, it's just imperative that at the beginning of the 21st century, we find ways to think about God uh, that are consistent with the tradition, 
with the meaning of scripture, not the literal every word of the page, but the overarching meaning, um, and that we find ways to communicate those ideas. Because I think if if we are not willing to do that or able to do that, Christianity has an awfully bleak future, and maybe it doesn't even deserve to have a future um, if, if we want to just pretend that certain things don't exist. So the last path to explore here is what John Hawk calls a, a path of engagement where we actually take the science of all of this as seriously as we can. Um, the separatist idea it is, is tolerant of evolution, but doesn't really embrace it as something to be celebrated. It's, uh, yeah, it happened, but God's, God's going to make it all you know, come out perfectly in the end. Um, an evolutionary theology would be one that looks at evolution in terms of God as the giver of possibilities um, and keeps in mind that evolution is something that describes not just what happened from pretty far on, you know, here, but all of this stuff all the way along and what's sometimes called the, the prebiotic phase of the cosmos, prebiology, those 10 billion or so years when it was, there were no life forms. But that was whatever was happening was still novelty was still occurring and things were happening. Um, what I think this then it, it moves us to is is just a fundamentally different way of understanding God's power, and that evolution has a way of focusing our reasons for hope. And I mentioned last week one of the things John Hot, who's a Georgetown theologian Jesuit, says is. That it's the job of theologies to give us reasons for hope. And if you, it, so you go to Romans 8, what Paul says that the whole creation, the whole, all the way across, the whole creation is groaning together for fulfillment, for redemption. Um, it's all about, that's why we titled it Everything Everywhere All at Once. It's all about everything and not just this very narrow view of human life being the only, only point. Um, okay, well, um, I didn't expect we'd get through all this. Uh, we can pick this up next week. What, what a God who's, who can, an understanding of God that can incorporate evolution, what, you know, what's necessary. Um, I mentioned Teilhard de Chardin, the French priest, uh, so he, he at one point said, who, who will who will give evolution its own god? In other words, who 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 among us will finally sit down and really help us think about what what do we need to envision about God then, so that we don't have to reject the ideas of science and evolution? And um, well, I'll develop this as we move into Einstein next week. But the last point on the page here is this means we really have to think seriously about power made perfect in weakness. That is such an inverted way and different way of thinking about what power means. But in fact, Paul says right there in Corinthians, this is the scandal that the world will never be able to get its head around. This is the stumbling block that, that logical thinking people will always fumble with, that somehow self-giving, self-emptying love, that's what the cross is all about, that that God is willing to be fully participatory, but not coercive. God will be there in every moment of suffering. God's there with the wasp eggs and the whole deal and the, you know, from the beginning. Um, but that's the, the, the power of God is, is there's a prayer. One of the prayers, colleagues, I forget which season, uh, God whose power is made known chiefly in showing mercy, <laughs> right? That's pretty revealing. So we'll try to we'll try to get to that. Um, I, I've I've got time to stay beyond this if you want to talk a little more, but we're at the end of the hour. So if you have other things you need to do, do it. Were you trying to ask a question about? No, okay, you're just scratching your head. Okay. All right. All right. Anything else? Or? I don't know. No, go here first. Go I was kind of raised in what I would call fantasy theology, uh, and yeah. it took me years to get away from. It. And I wonder if it's that fantasy theology that hates science so much. It feels threatened by it, right? Yes. 
Okay, and I, God help us, I think of the Creation Museum. <laughs> and what is its purpose <laughs> in, the, in a world where there's pretty reliable theology and pretty yeah. deeply reliable science? It's right. It's not the only way to relate to or conceive of God. If you've never, if the creation thing down in Kentucky, they built an ark. And, and um, <laughs> I like that I mean, God is going to saddle and the man yeah, right. it. Yeah, right. But I, I, mean, I, I think of that as just absolute kooky medukiness, yeah. you know, but mostly I think to just make us sad that that there's not a willingness to be open to new newness. Um, and it's because it, in the end, it's not even biblical. When you think about the promise in Revelation is God will make all things new. It is not that God will make all new things, right? It's whatever we've got is moving somewhere. I don't know what the end game looks like, but it's this is not in the left behind kind of theology where all this is going to be wiped away. We're going to be fished out of it and saved to some other realm. I don't, I don't see any reason to have to go there. I thought Tolkien's idea of how the resurrection could occur in reality, taking as much science as he did into effect, was uh, actually kind of weak. He thought that all that has to happen is because we're, since we are made up with high heavens, yeah. if God has a memory of which atoms went where in us, he can recreate any one of us at any age of our life and we'll be both directed. Yeah, and that it's it's a very sophisticated way of talking about intelligent design, yeah. which I think does not take Paul's language into account when God says you you'll you'll die into a physical body, but raised in a spiritual reality, which means it's not the realignment of atoms or whatever. A T O M S. I don't mean A D A M S. Uh, but it, it's. I don't know what that is. But that the God who stands behind this is able to move things forward into something. Right. Well, we'll, we'll have. That's really the two weeks from today. We'll try to tie some of these things together. Um, yep. Where Where was God before the Big Bang? <laughs> You want the Sunday school answer to that? <laughs> the Sunday school teacher would say, thinking of punishments for people like you who ask those kind of questions. <laughs> um, well, if uh, I mean, one possible answer to that, I think, is to say that if if the Big Bang represents a true creation of the cosmos, uh, a gift of God to be to to put something out there different from God, then God um, God was was beyond time. There it doesn't make any sense to think of a time before. And I don't know. I, I don't. I don't profess to have the physics all put together to nail that down. Yeah, but it's a worthy question. There is an answer to that, right. but that's why I don't have to God has been created. But right. Yes, and I, one answer to that is that some very sophisticated scientists would say we are we are living in a multiverse. This is not the only verse. There are other universes out there, or that the Big Bang was actually what some would call a big bounce. It 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 was it was another explosion of reality that followed in eons of time where this had happened before. I, I don't know. I mean, yeah. 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 Yes. It, 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 exactly. And what what I think we'll see a little bit with Einstein then, or when we talk about that, is well, what we've got to go on is what we can kind of deal with in our own universe. And I, I, I don't know. I mean, if you watch the movie, everything, everywhere, all at once, that'll blow your mind about yes. multiverse stuff. And I don't know. I can't. I don't have anything to say about that. Yeah. 
or as Forrest Gump would say, that's about all I got to say. <laughs> <laughs> okay, see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.